Hi, everybody. This is Pavan Agarwal from Folio Learner. Hope that you all are well. Hope that you are doing, uh, you are being safe and healthy with you and your families. Um, we are so happy that you have joined us uh, this morning uh, for some of you and in, uh, in the United States this evening or late afternoon on the West Coast. Uh, thanks for taking your time to sit with us and talk a little bit about licensing issues, uh, mostly in the IP space. Um, we've got a, a panel today of different speakers uh, with different backgrounds uh, in which we thought it was important to present to you not only sort of overall licensing terms or issues, but then also look at specific issues uh, in the pharmaceutical space, in the high tech space, and then in some crossover areas such as digital health. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So here's the very basic agenda. We're going to start with what, you know, just to get us warmed up, talk about uh, core licensing terms. Then we'll switch over to some more unique considerations in the high tech space. We'll then switch and go to the pharma space. And after that, uh, we'll talk about uh, digital uh, digital health and sort of the crossover areas, uh, including, you know, the application of AI or say an AI company uh, collaborating with a biopharma company. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Why don't I uh, start by asking uh, Andy Rollins. Andy Rollins is a partner in our Washington DC office and I've had the pleasure of working for An with Andy for uh, over two decades. Um, and his main area is, is in the technical, uh, in the TTO or tech transactions and outsourcing space. Andy, why don't you, uh, if you don't mind, get us started with talking about what are sort of the main terms that really affect the value of a license and tech transfer agreement. And again, this is sort of the starting level, and then we'll move into the more specific areas. Andy? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pavan. Uh, and as Pavan said, uh, I'm going to provide some context for uh, some of the deeper dive that some of my colleagues are going to be making uh, later in this presentation. Um, as we all know, pricing of a license agreement is really all about the perceived value on behalf of the parties to the transaction. And uh, we can go to the next slide, Lisa. Um, the licensor and licensee may look to certain approaches or, or methodologies to ascertain value. And, and uh, also, I suspect many of you are familiar with these. We may look to industry standards. Uh, for example, we may look at uh, or consider published royalty rates as an industry standard for, for setting a value. Uh, we may might use a rating or ranking uh, method that looks at existing agreement structures or terms to assign weights and try to derive a value from them. We might use rules of thumb. Uh, a lot of us are probably familiar with the 25% rule, which is a, a rule of thumb. Uh, evaluations uh, can get more, more um, uh, sophisticated using discounted cash flow analysis, possibly with some risk adjustments built in or other uh, approaches to ascertain the value of, of the license transaction. But ultimately, the sources of the value in the license agreement itself can be divided into six categories. And I'm going to cover each of the six in, in high level. There's the subject matter of the license, the extent of the exclusivity, the permitted uses and the limits on usage, the related rights and obligations, which are usually supporting factors or features of the license agreement. There's a structure of consideration. You know, how is how is the payment going to be structured? Uh, and then risk shifting mechanisms that may be built into the agreement. I'll go over each of these categories in an overview fashion. And like I said, my colleagues will address some more specific points or value drivers later in the presentation. So initially, let's start with subject matter. That's really the first and key source of, of value. What technology is the focus of the agreement? What form does it take? Uh, is it in registered IP, such as a patent or trademark? Is it unregistered IP, such as know-how or trade secrets? Depending on the context, really, each will have its, its own uh, unique value. Uh, Another category uh, of source of value is the extent of ex exclusivity. 
is it a non-exclusive agreement? Is it an exclusive agreement? If it's exclusive, is the exclusivity guaranteed or is it contingent? For example, could uh, early stage low sales volumes cause a loss of your exclusivity? Um, the Exclusivity grant, the express grant of exclusivity, is, is not the only manner in which an agreement might contain uh, some ability to, to maintain exclusivity in your marketplace. For example, there could be data exclusivity, which Steve M Mabius will be touching on a little later in the presentation. If we could go to the next slide, please. Another value driver is the permitted uses and the limits on usage of the license subject matter. Uh, is the license limited to a specific field of use? Is it limited to a specific geographic territory? Will the uh, licensee have the right to sublicense? Will the licensee have, the, have made rights where another party can manufacture for the licensee? What's the term of the license? How long will it last? Uh, does the licensor impose any restrictions on use? For example, the licensor may say that the uh, license is limited to research use only, which obviously would be a very significant uh, uh, imposition of, of a restriction on, on the usage of the, of the technology. There's a, a general or miscellaneous category, as I, as I categorize them, of related rights and obligations that can have a significant impact on value. Um, one such feature is the right to improvements. Does the licensee automatically receive um, rights under any improvements made by the licensee? Or on, on the other hand, uh, does the licensee receive any access or other rights to improvements uh, that the licensor, I'm, I'm sorry, does the licensor receive any access or other rights to improvements that the licensee makes on the uh, licensed technology? Um, there's also a consideration of whether the licensor will provide any technical assistance to the licensee. Uh, IP prosecution and IP enforcement also can become factors, you know, which party has the ability to control each of them and make decisions. Uh, which party is, is paying costs, those are also significant value drivers in the, in the overall transaction. Next slide, please, Lisa. Um, how the parties, I think we went one too many, uh, how the parties agree to structure the consideration or payments can have a significant impact on the overall overall value of the relationship. Uh, typically, uh, payments will be structured in the form of what I call success-based payments, meaning that the payments will grow as the commercialization of the technology grows. So you'll see that in the form of royalties. The more successful the technology is, the more royalties that are paid. Milestones or other progress payments uh, are, are similarly uh, structured as uh, uh, success-based payments, typically. Uh, other, other examples uh, could be, and, and it's a little bit more attenuated, but other examples could be common stock or partnership interests, where uh, the licensor is, is obtaining, for example, an equity stake in the licensee, and the value of that equity stake is obviously tied to the success of the licensee. Sometimes the payments may, will be structured in a way to remove risk on the licensor or the licensee. Uh, for example, requirements for lump sum payments or minimum royalty payments um, typically will reduce the risk for the licensor. On the other hand, royalty caps or royalty stacking provisions can reduce the risk for, for the licensee. So again, these are how you how this is structured. Is it going to drive the value of the overall relationship and the value that the parties put put on the overall relationship? And as a as a as a final category, there will be risk shifting provisions in the agreement that can often have a major impact on the value of the overall transaction. Uh, many times, some of these risk shifting provisions uh, can be some of the uh, final pieces that need to be hammered out in trying to reach agreement 
uh, on the license agreement. They'll typically be found in the form of representation and warranties uh, or as indemnifications in the agreement. And by risk shifting, I'm of course referring to which party will ultimately bear the risk. And, th and that risk may relate to product liability or the performance of the product. Um, another typical example is the risk might relate to the possibility of infringement of third party, party patents and who is going to bear uh, that risk. Again, very important drivers in the overall value of the transaction. So Pavan, I, I say that as a general overview of the drivers that you'll typically find in a license agreement, and hopefully this provides a context uh, for the remainder of our discussion today. Great. Thank you very much, Andy. That's a, a great sort of overview, uh, if you will. And so now I think what we'd like to do is turn to look at a more specific areas. And why don't we start with the you know, applications in the high tech space. And for that, I'm going to ask uh, Ashish Karkhanis. Uh, he's, been, he's got a, over a decade of experience, uh, including being a former US PTO examiner, having a computer engineering degree, actually having worked uh, at a patent aggregator uh, as well, um, and has joined us uh, in our California office. So Ashish, when you start thinking about taking some of these broader issues and applying them into you know, various areas of high tech, what are some of the, the considerations, some of the specific hypothetical situations that you see arise? Thank you, Pavan. The most important thing I think to keep in mind uh, when approaching a real world licensing app, a licensing situation is really on the practical effect uh, on the business uh, at a high level uh, and to use that as a prism through which to understand and to affect different licensing levers uh, that may arise in the transaction. So continuing on, we can think of a few examples uh, that are most relevant to the technology ecosystem and potentially uh, can be tailored to technology uh, industries uh, due to, for example, uh, the particular product life cycles uh, or uh, the nature of the use of individual uh, patented technology within the ecosystem. Specifically, we can dive into a few examples uh, that are not exhaustive here, but uh, can give us uh, some uh, specific practical guidance uh, within these areas. Uh, and the first is really uh, on ter in terms of the scope of protection. The second would be the term of protection. And the third would be conditions on license protection. And all of these different areas you may see uh, realize themselves in different ways uh, based on the overall business uh, and how your intellectual property will fit into that business. So continuing on, we can start with sublicensing and technology uh, by scope. And this is the largest uh, breadth uh, from which you can begin your analysis uh, and technologies um, that are listed here uh, may uh, be very uh, much impacted uh, by some of these uh, considerations. You can think of uh, common threads uh, among some of these technology areas in which uh, your business may supply uh, a downstream, downstream customer or may be supplied by an upstream customer. And we can see how uh, that sort of relationship uh, can manifest in uh, different industries uh, with uh, different uh, interplay between the different patented technologies uh, at issue. So continuing on, uh, in, the, in the area of scope, we can think about uh, sublicense rights and levers on those sublicense rights uh, in terms of what the addressable market or the market in which you and your competitors and your customers are active. And this can be divided in a number of ways uh, that can affect uh, the scope of the license. Uh, today, uh, we'll focus on two example but non-exhaustive ways of thinking about 
how to uh, describe and license the scope of the uh, of the protection that you're seeking. We can think of it both in terms of a customer specific focus or a product specific focus. So continuing on, we can look at an example that involves downstream customers. And in this brief example, we'll use a widget market as the key component that we may uh, evaluate our license scope on. The numbers here are less important than the relationships. Uh, here you have uh, uh, company A who has uh, a widget that supplies 50% of the market. Company B has the patent for the widget, but company A also has relationships with companies C and D. C, which has a relatively small percentage of the market, and D, which has a relatively large percentage of the market. And we ask ourselves, can company A include sublicenses for company C, company D, or both? Continuing on, we can think of a number of examples uh, in which we could have either or both licensed. In one example, company A could uh, preserve rights to sublicense company C, which has the smaller market share. Alternatively, company A could reserve rights for company D, which has the larger share, or both. Now, to separate these types of licenses uh, to these companies may incur a separate transaction cost or a differing transaction cost uh, based on the scope and the course of the negotiation uh, for the license. So whether you in your situation would choose C or D or both would depend on those uh, larger level, higher level uh, considerations for the business and for cost. So continuing on, we can then look at the downstream products situation. In the downstream product situation, we have the same company A and we have the same company B. Company A performs a process with steps one, two, three, and four, while company B provides a, a patent that performs steps one, two, and three. Company A also has a relationship with company C, which performs steps one, two, and four. Question is, can company A include sublicenses for company C's process in its patent license? Continuing on, we can see that sublicense that the co that company A could secure a sublicense for what we call a down for what we call a combination or subcombination of the license patent. Now, this may minimally affect a company's true infringement risk. However, it may provide an additional benefit uh, to uh, the sub to the sublicensed company or another business advantage to the to company A to provide uh, additional coverage that may um, uh, that may create more freedom to operate in the space for its sublicensed companies. Continuing on, we can take a look at term as well, and term in the technology industry may affect may be affected greatly by the very specific technology and the product lifestyle that uh, is common uh, to that product or to that technology space. Uh, other issues that may affect the term may also include whether uh, there's a first mover advantage or the number of credible competitors for the product in the space that may have, uh, affect the value of the license. So continuing on, we can think of uh, the term, the term discussion 
uh, of the licensing process uh, as primarily a process for understanding the value of the product revenue or the market over time, followed by an exercise to align the license costs with the product revenue cycle. And this can be a specific example of the structure of consideration as discussed earlier, whether it be a success-based uh, or a milestone-based uh, process. Continuing on, we can think of an example uh, for uh, company A and company B again, uh, for a widget that has a life cycle that increases, reaches its maximum, then decreases, and then is discontinued over a period of 10 years. And we can ask, can company A license that patent to offset the cost of the license with its revenue cycle? Continuing on, we can see an example in which company A secures a license in which payment terms and dates are described in that license and vary with success-based factors or with date-based fa uh, date based expiration periods, uh, for example. And those periods may be open to uh, broad uh, discussion and negotiation based on both the business context and the context surrounding the license. Continuing on, we can consider also a few conditions uh, and uh, conditions to the rights uh, of the license that may be affected in a number of situations, including, for example, uh, multi-party licensing transactions, licensing transactions where the original patent or intellectual property right is held by a third party, and the specific uh, situation of a cross-license of patent portfolios with significant numbers of uh, active patents therein. Continuing on, we can think of some of these conditions uh, in the third party context uh, or in some of the other contexts, both um, in terms of the permanence or the rec or the revocability, the revocability, excuse me, uh, of those licenses uh, in accordance with, for example, vesting periods, uh, which may be uh, contract terms that you may see in your licensing discussions. And finally, you may uh, want to consider having uh, a, a waiver of notice uh, before you even reach the end stage of the negotiation to protect yourself against uh, uh, willfulness or other issues that may uh, arise during the course of uh, presentation of a patent portfolio uh, by, uh, by a competitor or by a potential uh, licensor uh, to, uh, to your business. Great, thank you very much, uh, Shish. That was a uh, was very informative. And so, you know, as you indicate, trying to figure out sub license rights and and how do you work in the term of a of an agreement uh, and the like, especially when you're looking at sort of component, multi component um, type products and the like, uh, makes it sort of a creates a unique scenario, if you will, for licensing. Um, I'm just going to touch on a few issues related to standard essential patent licensing. It's an entire space in and of itself. And, um, you know, we're trying to cover some of the different areas today, so we're not going to get into too much of it. Um, but for those of you, uh, probably a number of you, a little bit more in the in the high tech space, the communication space being one good example, we'll see uh, and um, we'll experience a little bit more of the standard essential patents. And what we're talking about basically is technology standards where companies have come together and individuals as well and come up with a technology standard. You can so use the cellular standard 5G as an example. Um, and companies and individuals and the like, patent owners will have patents 
that in order to practice the standard, um, you will, in a sense, practice the one or more patent claims. So in trying to figure out the licensing in this space, there are some uh, rather unique considerations. And, and I've put a few uh, up here on the slides. What I want to mention is overall trying to figure out who's going to get the license. And that's, uh, you know, sometimes from a patent owner perspective, they would like that license to go to the end product maker uh, and not to, a, say, an upstream supplier. There are a lot of different ways to value the portfolio. Um, you use a top-down approach where, for example, you have an overall aggregate rate, and then you have to figure out how much this patent portfolio is worth out of the overall uh, set of patents that have been declared essential uh, to the standard. Um, you also want to figure out whether you're going to have a worldwide licensing or on a country-by-country -country basis. And you sometimes are, in a sense, forced or impacted by uh, changes and trends in litigation. And so um, there's a decision out of the UK uh, last fall uh, indicating that a court uh, may grant an injunction against a company uh, for infringing uh, a standard essential patent, uh, say in Britain, if that company refuses to take a worldwide license on Fran terms. And so some of the trends in litigation will affect um, how the licensing is carried out. Um, another situation is in the U.S. There's a case out of the Ninth Circuit uh, out in the West Coast, uh, the Federal Trade Commission against Qualcomm, uh, where at least in that case, uh, Qualcomm's approach for licensing to end product makers uh, was not deemed an antitrust issue. Um, and then the process of negotiating these licenses uh, is affected as well. There are court decisions uh, more uh, over, you know, over in Europe that sort of outline some of the obligations of the implementer side, that is, of the folks that are using the standard and what some of their obligations are, for example, to agree and show some uh, willingness to license on FRAN terms, fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory terms. And none of that, you know, some of those FRAND issues don't, you know, apply. They do apply if the patent owner has uh, showed an intent or a willingness to license on FRAND terms. You can do that through a letter of assurance, for example. Uh, but on the other hand, there are, there are some times where patent owners have uh, patents that read on standards that are not uh, declared um, and they are not assigned a letter of assurance. So there's a lot of unique considerations um, within the standard essential patent space. Uh, it, it often arises a bit more in the high tech space. And so that's probably, you know, a separate uh, area to discuss in more detail. But at least we wanted to touch upon it uh, so that you are aware of it. So with that, you know, we've we've now covered kind of the, the gen general terms, some of the big le high level terms that Andy mentioned. Uh, some of the more high-tech, unique considerations that Asish mentioned and some of the standard essential stuff that I've mentioned. Um, I'd like to next introduce uh, Catherine Parsons. Uh, Catherine um, it focuses more on the life science space. She's a very unique background doing both uh, IP patent counseling, uh, but also focusing now uh, more in the technology transaction space. And she brings with her, um, in addition to uh, a technical background, a legal degree, having worked at Genentech as a research associate. Um, and so she has a real flavor for some of the unique considerations uh, to look at in the pharma, biopharma type space. So why don't I have Catherine talk for a few minutes about some of those unique licensing considerations. Great. Thank you, Pavan. So um, we can move to the next slide here. And when we're thinking about pharma, some of the drivers really um, for the value and, and that uh, licensing um, engagement, the, the cost, right, it is really going to be unique when we're talking about pharma. We're talking about more of the market drivers, um, revenue potential, indications, you know, high unmet need. Um, or are we talking about, you know, some sort of differentiation from the standard of care? 
Um, and then you add in the concept of stage because there is a very specific um, uh, progression of molecules and, and that stage can also contribute largely to that value of the engagement. Um, when we're talking about things like the um, proof of concept stage, there's very little development that has gone into it at that point um, versus, you know, a molecule that's in phase three where there's, you know, quite a bit of development sunk costs there. Um, so that that largely does affect the value um, and, and it does so through risk, right? Um, and then we also have the third tier that I like to think of in the pharma kind of value drivers, which is the territory. Are we talking about a, uh, an engagement that's for global uh, rights? Or are we talking about something that's more territorial, um, perhaps a specific uh, region? And so um, when we're talking about something that's for a specific region, um, there are different, you know, considerations that have to go into that as opposed to it just being a, a global territory uh, license. And so um, we can move to the next slide. We can talk a little bit more about some of the, the unique considerations that we have in the pharma space. Um, a, a lot of times we have the concept of options um, and particularly for additional indications, because uh, almost always we have um, a compound that that at least has an indication that it's you know it's primary, but there are usually some potential secondary indications, and and potentially um, you know a follow on uh, molecules that may be similar to, but are, are not the primary molecule that's that's being um, licensed at that time, and so there's. There's different ways that you can structure those types of options, and um, and and there's definitely ways that you can um, that the the structure can reflect kind of the risk. So we're talking about um, lowering the risk for the uh, licensor, the person who. Uh, oh, sorry. So if we're talking about lowering the risk for the person who's acquiring the and uh, the compound. Um, many times uh, they would like to kind of push off on that cost and quit paying for those costs, cost of the options uh, until we're closer to the time when we're going to exercise it. Um, so there's uh, a possibility of, you know, kind of lower upfront cost to maintain that option with a more um, ex a stronger um, or greater amount of um, of, of cost there or payment there when we're going to exercise that option. Um, but then we're also talking about things like um, the uh, right of first refusal as another option to preserve that option right. So there's different ways to kind of structure that in, in, in other ways as well, but that just gives you a flavor of some of the different ways we can structure options and, and really uh, capture that engagement because, um, you know, when we're talking about pharma um, type of collaboration agreements and license agreements and and really, it's unlike any other industry in the partnership, there is just such a high level of engagement that is necessary for a successful outcome. And we're not just talking about the initial technology transfer, we're talking about ongoing cooperation. There are things such as, you know, regulatory considerations, even after market approval, we have, um, you know, pre-approval activities. If there's one uh, party who's um, going to be developing that compound in one territory and another party is developing the compound in another territory, you've got a lot of coordination that's going to happen both during the um, uh, the uh, development stage and then in, well into commercialization and the regulatory um, follow on. And so that that partnership should be, you know, certainly structured in a way that that provides, um, you know, that coordination, but also is able to um, uh, follow, you know, to um, to to make sure that that everyone is uh, engaged in the uh, in the project. So there is a successful outcome and, and largely you see a lot of that through uh, joint um, uh, joint committees um, that are kind of set up to be able to make sure that that's smooth. Um, 
Another uh, consideration that we talk about a lot in the pharma is the collaboration IP. This is something that is just absolutely um, one of the most contentious points when we're talking about um, negotiating um, the, the license. And, and it really comes down to there is a lot of um, development that goes into these compounds and there's a lot of IP that is developed through that. And, you know, being able to structure those buckets of IP and who has rights to them afterwards um, it is a matter of um, it, it, substantial consideration and discussion. And there's ways to, to really structure it that is um, most uh, efficient for everyone, but is also, um, it, it gets everyone, you know, um, comfortable with the IP that they are, the resulting IP that's in their bucket, um, either through licensure, or through ownership, um, through a covenant not to sue. There's there's different ways that we can structure these things so that everyone ends up happy um, and and has the, the IP rights that they need for, you know, regardless of, of uh, what ends up happening um, with the um, with the compound. Um, another uh, thing that that tends to be kind of these pitfalls is the reasonable effort standard, and that reasonable effort standard is very jurisdictional de dependent in some ways. You know, you have best efforts, commercially reasonable efforts, and reasonable efforts. And, and those can be interpreted by courts differently depending on, you know, what country you're in possibly. Um, and, and those are very, very um, important because they are, you know, certainly from the, um, from both the licensor and the licensee perspective as to, you know, what efforts uh, do you need to put in to meet that? And it's not always a, a crystal black and white. Um, there is a lot of gray. And so um, leading to a lot of gray, you, you have the potential for dispute. So it's always helpful if those, um, you know, what meets those standards can be put up front and set within the agreement, but that's not always realistic. And so, um, you know, putting some additional um, meat on that, um, you know, when we're drawing out the license agreement is, is quite helpful. Um, it, it's not always possible though. So um, it's one of those things of, it, it's a nice to have if we can have it, but the, the true um, important thing is is really making sure that the that the efforts are um, consistent with the level of the engagement for for whatever the project is. And that leads us into kind of the choice of law and form selection type of arbitration. Um, those provisions can also be when we're talking about a um, you know particularly in the pharma industry when we're talking about compounds that do have more than territorial <clears throat> implications. So something that, you know, happens in one territory can affect um, things that happen in other territories. And so that choice of law and form selection clause can be very, very important and should be thoughtfully decided up front um, so that you're able to make sure that that it, it matches the nature of the activities or the, the nature of the entities who are involved. Um, and I really think that, that that's one that, that should be thought about as well in terms of, you know, it's a, it's a trap for the unwary if you're getting into um, certain arbitration where um, perhaps you uh, are limiting your discovery. Um, and so you have to think about those types of things when you're thinking about whether you should include an arbitration clause or not, um, and particularly when we're talking about international uh, license agreements. Um, but ultimately, you know, the license or collaboration agreement should reflect, you know, the value that each party is contributing. Um, and we can move on to the next. Great. Um, and then uh, just some some emerging trends that we're kind of seeing in the pharma industry is, you know, uh, and we're going to talk about this here next in, in greater detail, but there are emerging technologies that are kind of, you um, uh, you know, quite a bit of uh, overlap and um, coordination that wasn't really in the space previously. And so um, you bring with that emerging technologies, you have brand new service uh, solution providers um, who are 
you know, relatively uh, uh, inexperienced in the pharma space. And so bringing their level of knowledge up um, to match your own is, is important, but also, um, you know, making sure that you're matched with the right, you know, kind of a solution there and the due diligence behind that. Um, but they are shaking up the space. You know, we have Amazon who's who's moving into healthcare. And so there, there are, you know, completely new solution providers in, in all um, of the uh, healthcare and life sciences industries. And, and that's, you know, definitely um, going to be interesting to see that, that's likely a trend to continue. It'll be interesting to see what other um, parties kind of enter into the traditional pharma space. Um, we also ha have seen increased capital availability, particularly with um, the in intro the in the increase in the number of uh, private equity that's moving into the space, particularly with like the uh, uh, growth uh, stage companies. So that's that's something that that is interesting and and should be you know uh, consideration when when we're looking at these types of license agreements. Um, and then uh, going forward, there's you know the the types of compounds that are being manufactured now are requiring much much more capacity than they used to, and so there's an increase in investment in manufacturing that's going on as well that I think is is something to consider. And and when we're talking about license agreements, um, that raises the manufacturing, um, you know, the allocation of who's manufacturing um, the compound and whether they would be doing so just for clinical or um, or whether we're talking about commercial supply as well um, and, and making sure that the agreement, you know, uh, reflects that that type of investment. Um, and then lastly, uh, because this is brand new to the space, we do have a new regulatory regulatory regime in um, affecting anything that um, has access, um, use, or sort of integration to uh, electronic health records. Um, and so that uh, the, the new regulatory regime actually imposes restrictions on what you can, um, uh, on the fees that you can charge. And um, so there's certain things that have to be met for uh, your license fees to kind of pass muster if you are engaged in that uh, healthcare industry where your product may um, touch upon something that, that accesses, uses, or, or sort of integrates with electronic health records. So um, be aware of that. And, um, and, and of course, we're always happy to help um, provide additional information on that. But um, I'm going to turn this over now to talk a little bit more about the combinations um, of, of from pure pharma to kind of the pharma um, digital um, uh, solution space. So, um, Steve, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you now. Thank you very much, Catherine. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Steve Mabius. Uh, and my specialty is mainly on the biopharma side, but I'm fortunate to have these great colleagues at Foley with backgrounds in other areas that are starting to converge more and more. And so that's what I'm going to address here briefly is the convergence that we see happening in digital health, where really there are three areas kind of coming together pharmaceuticals, software, and devices. And at the intersection of all three, there are some really interesting and novel kinds of products that are being developed through license agreements and collaboration. Things like smart pills, digital inhalers, digital therapeutics, and digital biomarkers. Uh, next slide, please. And so what are some of the special licensing considerations that need to be addressed in these situations? Well, there are certain areas of unfamiliarity, I think, when you look at it from the perspective of the tech side and when you look at it from the perspective of the pharma side and the tech side, these companies are less familiar with FDA processes and healthcare reimbursement system 
and how products are valued and reimbursed by the medical system of a given country. On the pharma side, they're going to be less familiar with software as a product or service and licensing of digital technology. Um, also, there are new regulatory standards, as Catherine mentioned, that are unfamiliar to both pharma and, and tech companies, really. And, you know, that's a really important point is that the FDA is kind of scrambling to keep up, at least in the US, with the developments of this convergence of technology. And so I think it's important for licenses and collaboration agreements to think about these areas and, and how to address the uncertainty of the regulatory landscape uh, in, in the agreements. Next slide, please. So I wanted to give a, a very short case study about one type of digital health product called Abilify MySight, which was a collaboration between uh, a digital health company called Proteus, who made a type of pill sensor that can actually be put into a pharmaceutical tablet and swallowed, and then the pill um, notifies a smart device that the patient has actually taken their dosage. And the drug in this collaboration came from Otsuka Pharmaceuticals. And they had together performed clinical trials that showed that the drug that was previously approved without the sensor was even better when it had the sensor in terms of getting better patient outcomes through increased uh, compliance with the recommended dosing. And so one important aspect of this type of product is that in addition to the patent exclusivity, it was able to receive three years of data exclusivity from the FDA that started upon its approval in 2017. So in addition to patents, we have to think about other types of exclusivity that may be uh, deal drivers and create value from these kinds of collaboration. Next slide, please. The, uh, the other aspect I wanted to cover is that there were also new types of patents that were generated uh, from the collaboration, including some that were listable in the Orange Book, which is a kind of a valuable designation for pharmaceutical products. And these particular patents claimed a combination of the pill sensor with the drug. And drug device combinations can be harder for generic companies to copy because it's not as easy to separate the individual parts and establish bioequivalence. So there's definitely a great value proposition from combining digital technology with previously approved drugs uh, as a way to improve patient outcomes and help pharma companies differentiate their products from uh, generic competition that will occur after the original drug patents expire. Next slide, please. And so one kind of prologue about this case study is that this past year, Proteus ended up filing for bankruptcy after it had raised an enormous amount of money. And actually, it was one of the original digital health unicorns um, that had generated quite a lot of optimism and enthusiasm among investors. And so I think that raises an important point is that there may be some kind of frothy valuations in this area because it's a very exciting technology and it has enormous promise. But there's also uncertainty still about how these products will actually be received in the market and ultimately how the healthcare system will reimburse the value proposition that we talked about in the previous slide. 
Um, so we have to ask questions like how much of an improvement in patient outcome is there? Um, how will it be reimbursed? Will insurance companies cover the price differential between these improved digital health products and traditional pharmaceutical products? And another, another consideration is that some companies that are traditionally generic are also starting to embrace digital health themselves. So they are developing new ways to improve their products and the lines are becoming blurred a little bit. So for example, Teva has a digital inhaler, which I showed in the slide, and it's actually a platform product that will apply to multiple different kinds of drugs as a way to increase the value of what it's providing to patients relative to a traditional generic that doesn't have that kind of um, improvement for patient outcome. It revolves around AI and machine learning. And I know many of you are getting more and more involved um, and your companies are getting more involved when it comes to AI. And could we turn to the next slide? Um, so whole sort of development around AI itself from not only collecting the data and having people that are specialized in how to process the data, but then, you know, how do you, where do you store it and how do you train people to really understand it? So AI itself is a sort of very burgeoning and has been accelerating uh, space. Um, and if we turn to slide 38, which is three slides forward, please. It seems to be stuck. Um, uh, great. Uh, you'll see here, we just gave some examples of collaborations between uh, AI type companies and pharma companies. Um, and the AI companies come in all shapes and sizes from pure uh, tech players to, and big tech players, to companies that are, say, startups that are more specialized in the application space of biopharma. So one area that I think about when we uh, consider licensing in this space is what role is each company going to play? Is the AI company going to be there just to provide a, an AI engine and it's sort of a one-off issue? Or is the AI company actually going to be part of the actual development uh, along in sort of the drug discovery, as an example, uh, with the biopharma company. And so that can determine some of the terms uh, of the licensing deal. But I don't know, Steve or Catherine or Andy, what are some of the other things that you see uh, in this space? Sure. And this is Catherine. I think that um, one of the ways that I think from a pharma perspective that AI and ML can really be utilized beyond just the, the traditional concept of, you know, AI or ML for drug discovery, but really there's so many more complementary ways that AI and ML can be utilized. Um, when we're talking about manufacturing, increasing yields and, and reducing manpower and as we get into uh, increasing uh, capacity for um, manufacturing that will be coming, um, really beginning to utilize the full capacity and capabilities of uh, AI and ML to really capture and be able to um, to utilize that extra capacity because while you can always build more, you know, uh, you can always build more, you, you need to have someone there to be able to, um, you know, to, 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 to watch everything that's being um, put together. And so, you know, getting those, those people, that's going to be a limitation and AI and ML can really step in there to fill that, uh, that, that gap. Great. Thank you. Steve, what, uh, what about from your end? Yeah, uh, one thing I would add is that the, the development of digital biomarkers and really as a, as a proxy for traditional, what, what we would call biochemical markers for determining whether a drug satisfies 
the FDA's efficacy requirement is really an exciting thing where AI is being used um, together with wearable devices to measure uh, certain types of data from a patient that reflect alternative ways of measuring efficacy. And so what that gives rise to is a totally different clinical trial paradigm uh, that can be performed much, much more efficiently without having to take blood tests and things like that. So it's, it's just a tremendous value saver uh, for, for the whole drug development process, and it requires a rethinking of the way that clinical trials are performed and all the agreements that go along with that have to be um, re-engineered to address this type of technology. Great. Uh, Ashish or Andy, anything else from uh, any observations from your end? Uh, just just really quickly, Pavan, I don't think it's uh, particularly new, but just seeing how AI can really provide quicker validation of, of the drug target and optimization of, of the design is, is uh, something that's just always in, in, intriguing and uh, any cost savings is, is, is particularly valuable. Great, great point. Thank you. Um, well, why don't we turn it to slide 40, Lisa, if you don't mind, which is the final slide. And I didn't see any questions pop up um, as we were going through, but I'll, I'll wait to just a 10 or 15 seconds if anybody wants to go ahead and unmute themselves or show themselves on video and ask a question or type it into the side. Okay, well, we are also available. Uh, you see our email address is here uh, that you can write to us anytime. Um, I wanna thank Lisa Frymark and Lauren Klippel, but let me take a moment, uh, if you don't, don't mind, in Miami Willie, who has been really our chief business development guru for our department and the IP department at Foley for many, many years, um, just retired uh, on Monday, uh, you know, last yesterday, in fact, um, it was a tough day for a lot of us uh, to see a Mayumi uh, depart officially from our team. She's been such a leader, uh, such a valuable contributor that uh, for so many of us um, has been a, a real um, strong advocate for uh, doing, you know, us getting us out into the marketplace and doing events like this. Um, and she really looks forward and tries to figure out what's going on uh, in the industry. Um, and I just can't, on behalf of all of us, want to thank Mayumi so much for her contributions over the years. Uh, we will sorely miss you uh, from a standpoint of a day-to-day -day basis, but uh, we hope uh, that we get the chance to continue to interact with you. And for all of you that have ever had the pleasure to experience Mayumi, um, you know the kind of energy that I'm referring to. So Mayumi, uh, thank you uh, so very, very much. Um, I did see a last second question uh, come in, which is how are regulators viewing regulators viewing the use of AI in drug development? And so why don't I throw that out to the panel? Perhaps uh, Steve or Catherine might be uh, well suited for this one. Sure, Steve, do you want me to take this or are you, do you want to jump in? I, I can offer one quick comment. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not an FDA lawyer, so please take it with a grain of salt. But I think to the extent that AI is simply identifying molecules um, that can be further developed in a traditional way, it probably doesn't have that much impact on regulatory process. But to the extent that AI does something like I was talking about, where it creates a new type of digital biomarker together with a wearable device, I think that is required that that's causing a lot of scrutiny by the FDA because it it requires a lot of validation to be able to show that a digital biomarker can truly substitute 
for showing what a traditional blood biomarker can establish about the effect uh, of a drug on, on the body. So, so that's one um, sort of way that I see it having different impacts on the FDA process. Yeah, and I agree with that. I think we also have seen some comments about, you know, when uh, that biomark or when that um, AI and ML um, software is being used for things such as diagnosis and treatment, it is, you know, you get into a much different um, uh, category <laughs> in the FDA. Again, not an FDA lawyer, but um, but but that that is one of those areas where um, they have kind of elevated that um, kind of um, diligence that would be done by um, the FDA. So uh, you know it, it really depends from from what I've seen in, in terms of how they're taking it. It depends on you know what they've been um, you know what the what the intended effect is of the of the software, um, but also um, they, they floated this concept of uh, kind of um, uh, uh, leaderships and, and the business entities themselves being approved as opposed to the platform itself. So there was an interesting um, pilot program that had been going around. Um, for kind of AI and ML innovators and getting approved um, uh, through that um, uh, kind of a, a, a parallel pathway as, as an entity instead of as your software. So that, that was a really interesting uh, way it tacked that they took. Uh, it's still, you know, to be decided, uh, you know, how, how far they're going to follow that out and, and what the eventual results of that pilot program will be. And Pavan, one one quick point. I'm like uh, Steve. I am not an F FDA lawyer, but I know there's been some call for uh, some more FDA, potentially some more FDA oversight when you look at applying um, AI uh, for drug discovery to maybe a less than diverse uh, population. And what does that mean for the full diverse population? Does it exacerbate a, a problem with having effective drugs for the more diverse uh, population? So I, I, as the, the field continues to develop, I think there's going to be a, a number of areas like that where we're going to need to explore and, and, and remedy. Great. Thank you. Uh, so on behalf of Ashish, uh, Catherine, Andy, Steve, and myself, uh, thank you all so much uh, for taking your time today. Uh, we really appreciate it. If you have uh, any follow-up questions or you want to correspond with us, you see our email address is here. Uh, please make sure to take a moment to download the presentation as well and uh, stay well. Thank you so much. Take care now.